almost there. Um, it's all yours, Aaron. All right. Yeah, yeah. So basically, no, no, I'm not. Not all right, hello. <coughs> it's my pleasure uh, today to introduce Volker Brom. Uh, he received his PhD from Yale University. Uh, did a brief postdoc at University of Cambridge, and then came here for uh, his postdoc at Harvard University, what, uh, 20 years ago? <laughs> um, since 2004, he's been a professor at UT Austin, and uh, since 2019, he's been the department chair at, at Austin, and also um, has, has a named uh, professorship there. He's received numerous awards for distinguished research and also for teaching. Uh, he's had numerous invitations for review articles, books, and talks, and so forth. And finally, uh, he's supervised many students and postdocs, um, but he was also a mentor to many more than, than he was actually supervised. Um, in fact, he was my own PhD advisor, which is why I'm introducing him. Um, and it's, he's been incredibly influential in my professional life and also my personal life. And uh, always very kind to give advice. And I think um, I kind of owe the, the topic of my PhD to, to him. This was put on my desk when I first got there. <laughs> and, you know, maybe naive, naively I, I just ran with it, an ambitious idea. Um, maybe some anecdote is, um, so he's originally from Germany, and he uh, likes to keep the ties. So every year he goes back to visit his, his family. And um, he's even, uh, he has a daughter, and he's even taught her German and had this important link. Um, I think when, when she was young, you uh, essentially opted to only speak German to her, which uh, was, was this effective? Uh, she translated uh, to my benefit uh, everything into English because she felt I was a little bit not quite up to up to <laughs> coach. <laughs> yeah. All right, without further ado, thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. And uh, yes, so it is a real pleasure to be back. Um, so 20 years, uh, I can tell you, it doesn't, doesn't really uh, seem like it. Uh, it's incredibly nice to, uh, to have the chance to, uh, uh, to be here again. And I remember when I was a postdoc, right, this place, uh, sitting here, of course, right, you all know this, right, this is a charming, magical uh, room, a magical uh, space. And uh, um, also, um, it's the first time for me that I, I visit um, uh, in person again after right, three years of what I guess we all have done, right, um, Zoom colloquia, Zoom uh, seminars. Of course, this is, I guess, what we all did to keep things going. But of course, it's very different right, to, to connect people uh, with people, communities for the first time, to reconnect. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, uh, it's super nice to be, to be back. And um, so um, my, my subject today, as uh, Aaron said, um, Right. What do we know about the first stars and galaxies? And the truth is, I have been at it um, as a theorist uh, since my, my PhD thesis, and of course, right, for, uh, for all this time, um, also when I was at, uh, at, at the CFA, right, working with Lars and Avi and, and others. Right. Uh, of course, it was theory. It was projecting into the future uh, at the moment, at the time when finally the, the James Webb uh, a telescope would, uh, would fly. And of course, at some point uh, in grad school, I was very naive, right? Uh, uh, we were promised the launch is um, 2007. And then at some point, I realized, right, the delta T was always 10 years. And the delta T was always, uh, so, and of course, at some point, obviously, this got all of us into trouble. And then, of course, really, uh, very fortunately, eventually, right, delta T became zero. And of course, we all know uh, the rest of the story. But now it's really incredibly interesting, as, of course, we all know, right, to see, uh, to confront our ideas about the early universe. Um, and of course, right, this is a place where, of course, really, also many of the ideas have been pioneered and are still being pursued, right, that now we can... Um, we can confront this with, uh, with reality. So I think right, we are all in for an incredibly exciting uh, run. Uh, just to, to set this up, the big picture, which of course I think is really utterly beautiful. Right? We have this idea that um, in the primordial fireball, we put into place uh, quantum fluctuations, the seeds for all of cosmological structure formation, and then over, over 14 billion years, 
uh, of cosmic evolution, right? We uh, uh, have a universe that is incredibly uh, complex, highly structured, uh, and uh, in the model of, uh, of uh, cosmological structure formation, right, the prediction is that um, a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, we, uh, we see the end of the Dark Ages, the formation of the first stars, first galaxies, when we have this uh, fundamental transition in the, in the state of the universe from initial simplicity to complexity. And um, then, of course, really there, there are all these ideas built on our uh, standard model of cosmology. And then, of course, in terms of observation, right, we absolutely have a well-calibrated set of initial conditions, the cosmic microwave background. And then there is the high redshift frontier. Right? Sort of, this is um, a billion years. This is basically the Hubble frontier. But of course, this frontier is moving right, uh, into, into this uh, final frontier of, uh, of cosmology. So at some point, this idea that um, right, uh, we have this, uh, this entire history of the universe in front of us, and now we can push back uh, into this final period is breathtakingly beautiful. And um, just to maybe more uh, abstractly uh, to put this into place, right, we have um, what we could call the, the standard model of the first star formation. In principle, we have all the, the ingredients um, for uh, addressing this problem, right, our lambda CDM model of cosmology. We know how the universe uh, right, expands, uh, uh, the dynamics of the universe, general relativity. We have a very highly calibrated understanding of the matter energy contents of the universe. And very crucially for, uh, for everyone right, who does structure formation, uh, cosmological simulations, we have a very good idea what the initial uh, density fluctuations are. Uh, and then uh, in the case of the first stars, then this is now uh, nice also on the baryonic part. We have uh, the, right, the um, most simple conditions imaginable in the baryonic universe, right? primordial gas, pure hydrogen, helium. So we have a very good understanding in principle of all the ingredients. Um, atomic hydrogen, molecular hydrogen. So right, this is a situation, and this is what I learned from Avi uh, right, uh, when, when, when I was a grad student. In principle, right, this is, uh, you can write down these ingredients on a, on a small set of, uh, of papers. Um, and then out of this, uh, all this beauty, all this structure uh, develops. And of course, this then brings in now a really important point. So at some point, again, schematically, right, we could sort of look at this um, early history of the universe um, that we have right, uh, the inputs uh, given uh, from, uh, from the cosmic microwave backgrounds, cosmological parameters. Uh, then we, uh, right, we have the laws of nature, uh, use uh, supercomputers which become ever more powerful. Uh, and then right, the outputs are nonlinear consequences. Um, Right, things like uh, whatever you are interested in, uh, stellar systems, uh, the properties of the, of, the, of the stars, the galactic assemblies. Uh, so out of microscopic inputs, we get macroscopic outputs. So in a way, right, this dream of a, of a Renaissance philosopher. But of course, also then, right, this uh, uh, has important consequences because we can turn this around. And then one really important ingredient here is uh, uh, the, the, right, the microphysical properties of the dark matter particle. And of course, this is something that uh, we don't really know, as we have learned. Uh, right? We had the idea it should be some kind of um, um, right, cold dark matter, um, um, right, weakly interacting uh, massive particle, a WIMP. But of course, right, the WIMP doesn't show up in the, in the laboratories on Earth, so we have a problem. Uh, so now suddenly, uh, right, we have a huge uh, playground of uh, possibilities for what the dark matter is on on the particle physics viewpoint. And it turns out that right, what we assume, it doesn't really matter so much if we look at the large scale, uh, the very large scale structure of the universe, right, Milky Way scales. But what we put in here uh, matters greatly for, for the very beginning, right, the small scales where the first stars and galaxies form. So all of this is, a, is in a way a powerful laboratory, right, macrophysical laboratories to test microphysics. And um, there are some aspects uh, of the standard model that really are uh, robust. Uh, all groups um, with different methodologies, different uh, simulation codes agree on those aspects. So we have, the, um, right, uh, in general terms, just to briefly summarize the standard model of first star formation, right, the cosmic web. Um, this shows the, the cosmic hydrogen in projection. Then right, uh, we, uh, we zoom in on, um, on the... the the host systems for the beginning of star formation, mini halos, million solar masses, that's just 2030. And then if we zoom in, uh, then we get to a very important scale in, uh, in cosmological structure formation. This is the first time that we have a baryonic object that is decoupling from the dark matter. Right? 
until this point, dark matter completely calls the shots, but now the, uh, the baryons, the gas, uh, decouples. Uh, and uh, right in the language of present-day star formation, we could call this the pre-stellar core, um, a few hundred solar masses, um, a size of a parsec, and this now is the immediate progenitor for, uh, for star formation in the early universe. And then uh, with, uh, with uh, better computer power, we realized that inside of these uh, pre-stellar cores, inside of a dark matter mini halo, um, this is sort of how then star formation proceeds. Um, um, right? There is a disk. Um, uh, the disk is unstable. Uh, so um, the, the message here is uh, that uh, the first stars form in a similar way to, uh, to, uh, to stars today right? in uh, the form of small multiples. Um, and then, well, and then um, now sort of um, until this, this is a agreed standard model. Now there are two frontiers um, and lots of progress has been made uh, uh, with different groups, uh, powerful supercomputer simulations, but there's sort of two frontiers still to really nail this and uh, uh, answer the question, right, what are the properties of the first stars? The first frontier is that, uh, well, if you then look into the center of uh, of the dark matter uh, mini halo, the pre-stellar core, then right, this is a complex uh, situation in terms of uh, right, there's an initial protostar, um, there's subfragmentation, there's merging, right, viscosity, um, uh, some of the, of the fragments may be ejected. Um, so uh, all of this then is, a, is a, right, an intricate dance of, uh, of, uh, of how these protostars interact in the protostellar disk. And then if you just look at this plot here, right, just sort of look at this, um, um, uh, these two curves, this shows the number of uh, fragmentation. Um, this is sort of the black curve, and then the red curve is the number of mergers. So at some point it's high, but they trace each other, and then eventually they decay. And the outcome is that inside of a, of a mini halo, right, then we end up with a, right, with a small multiple of stars, so right, uh, uh, five to ten stars. Uh, but again, sort of this really is uh, computationally very, very demanding. So um, this is a, a simulation that can trace the situation for 5,000 years. Right? Then, of course, uh, right, we can push this further, but uh, um, that's sort of one frontier. The other important frontier is radiation hydrodynamics. So at some point, right, we, we have one protostar, this little white symbol. If you look uh, right, with uh, very sharp eyes in the, in the center of the, of the collapsing uh, cloud, um, and one sort of this, uh, this protostar grows to, uh, uh, I'd say, of order 10 solar masses or so, then um, radiative feedback kicks in. Here is sort of this hourglass morphology, uh, an ionization bubble, and there's radiation pressure right, trying to uh, switch off the accretion. Um, and uh, well, again, so, sort of those two frontiers, um, then of course the question is, right, what really then is the final initial mass function of the, of the first star formation, population three star formation? And, uh, right, um, Qualitatively, the main message is that uh, it is top-heavy, so that uh, right, we have uh, this overall star formation process um, right, shifted to, uh, to uh, mass scales of a few 10 solar masses or so. But then, in a way, at some point, right, um, a decade ago, uh, we were sort of hopeful and said that just by, by pure right, power of reasoning, right, uh, um, by sheer computational power, we could nail this completely up initio. Right, uh, uh, we would uh, have the complete prediction of the, of the primordial initial mass function. That probably is uh, naive. Right? Um, star formation is stochastic even in the early universe. And I think right, just from ab initio, pure right, theoretical reasoning, we will never completely nail the initial mass function of the first star. So uh, as always in astronomy, we absolutely need guidance from, from observations. Um, and uh, right, um, so there are questions, right, what happens on the low mass end? Uh, are there low mass survivors um, that we might find in the Milky Way um, on the high mass end? Right? Can we trigger things like pair instability, supernovae? Um, uh, but um, if you like, uh, right, sort of, this is, of course, a cartoon. So um, right, this is our version. If you, at some point, right, need an IMF for the first stars, right, this would be our suggestion. Um, right, uh, so it's a, it's a logarithmically almost flat situation. Um, so really uh, top heavy. Um, but again, of course, right, this is obviously right, uh, not the end of the, uh, of the game. But sort of, these are typical, right, typical predictions that you find in the, in the literature. So um, that's the, the first message. The first stars were. Uh, uh, predominantly massive, typical masses uh, that would trigger core collapse supernovae. And then just very briefly, right, then you can ask other questions about the properties of this unknown population of stars. So one question is, right, what about rotation? Of course, rotation, super important for chemical evolution, right, the way that the first stars might die, right, collapse stars, um, right, triggering gamma ray bursts. And just very briefly, there is some understanding that the first stars were typically rotating uh, very rapidly. Um, so um, 
But then also there's a, there's a caveat. So if you just look at the rotation velocity right, versus time, this, uh, this uh, right, a solid line, this shows the prediction for right, uh, pure hydrodynamics. So really there's, a, there's close to breakup. But then it turns out that if one throws an MHD, magnetohydrodynamics effects, then right, there could be very, very significant breaking. So there seems to be some kind of bifurcation, slow rotation, rapid rotation. And what the breaking ratio is, the branching ratio is, that is not not clear. So the MHD uh, frontier is also there. But um, um, if you sort of take this at face value, so we have these first stars being typically massive, and then um, very rapidly we have supernova activity, um, and uh, this just sort of shows um, right, uh, one important uh, aspect. Um, so uh, this, uh, right, this circle shows uh, the virial radius of a dark matter host mini halo. And then inside we, right, we trigger one of the first pop three supernovae, a core collapse supernovae, completely disrupts the system. This is density, this is temperature, and this sort of is the key. This shows the metallicity. So white, in this case, is um, uh, completely primordial, and then this is sort of the enrichment. And then what you see is that, well, um, right, um, metals, uh, right, part of the metals make it out into the intergalactic medium, but uh, another part is, uh, is constrained. So uh, this means is we have we start a primordial universe, um, we form the first stars, uh, and then uh, right, very, very rapidly the universe is uh, uh, enriching itself with, uh, with locally with a flaw of, uh, of heavy chemical elements. And this will come back in a moment when we think about what, what we predict for, for the James Webb Space Telescope deep field. Um, sort of now this shows this uh, enrichment of the early universe on much larger scales, the cosmological scales, uh, four megaparsec. Um, and uh, this, again, right, is the total metallicity uh, from stars at a redshift of eight. So clearly within reach of what, uh, what deep fields uh, uh, of the JWST will find. And if you look at this, again, white is um, primordial, and then, right, the different levels of enrichment. So the message here is twofold. First, that um, right, at, at, at these redshifts, most of the volume of the universe um, is still completely pristine. So right, the low column density intergalactic medium is still uh, completely pristine, but wherever the action is, where galaxies form, uh, where we have bias situations, right, we have a significant uh, metal enrichment, 1% um, uh, solar, 10% solar. So there's sort of this bifurcation. Metals are there uh, where, where we form galaxies, and then there is the pristine, uh, the pristine uh, low column density IGM. Uh, but the, the important aspect here is that within these variants of um, cosmology, right, as long as we work within lambda CDM cosmology, then one um, a very, very robust uh, prediction is that the universe very early um, uh, basically uh, right, uh, forgets that it, uh, that it uh, engaged in population three star formation. So if you just look at the, the cosmic star formation rate density as a function of, of time, so high redshift, low redshift. And then right, uh, we start with this blue curve, which is, um, which is population three star formation. Of course, this is what, what we have in the beginning. But then if you look at this curve, uh, this reddish orange curve, which is population two, population one, right, then the, the main message is that very, very rapidly, um, right, uh, population two uh, and one metal enriched star formation dominates by orders of magnitude. And this happens at a very high redshift. So that really, really means that in the history of the universe, Metal-free pop three star formation is quickly hidden by, right, by these generation after generation of, uh, of uh, metal, um, metal uh, enriched uh, star formation. That also means is that, uh, that uh, the JWST in its deep fields will find typically population two galaxies, metal enriched galaxies. It will not find primordial galaxies. Uh, and um, right, um, to, um, to see this, um, right, we, uh, yeah, we start with this first generation, um, first stars. Uh, uh, metal-free, we have supernova feedback, and then uh, right, already the second generation of stars is, uh, is metal-enriched. And um, just to, to drive this home, right, this now is um, a simulation that um, right, shows the, the assembly of a first galaxy, a bona fide galaxy uh, just below a billion solar mass total. So right, this is dark matter um, uh, showing the cosmic web. Uh, this here is the, right, uh, the size of the, of the growing uh, first galaxy. And uh, the important uh, plot here again is sort of this here. This shows again the metal enrichment. Now, um, I apologize for that, the color scheme is different. Black is pure hydrogen helium, and all this color green, reddish, is the metal enrichment. And if you just sort of zoom in now, right, then um, the message is that uh, these first galaxies, right, there's uh, inhomogeneity, right, there will be a, a spread of uh, metal enrichment, but there are metals everywhere. Uh, and uh, so uh, already the first galaxies are 
right? Quite complicated, metal enriched, and far from being primordial. So it is as if the universe is sort of hiding uh, the primordial beginnings very rapidly. There is a screen. And of course, then the, the question is, right, can we penetrate the screen? Can we get beyond this to the true um, moment of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the beginning? And um, also then, of course, right, if you start with a, with a galaxy that has this complicated mix, metallicity, then of course, really, there is a, in terms of the spectrum, right, there is a, there is a rich, uh, Right, strong nebula emission line spectrum uh, that is predicted, and of course this also will be in reach of uh, of the, right uh, once we get the spectroscopic data from uh, uh, from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and in terms of prediction, I just sort of want to show one more thing, and then right, we we switch gears somewhat. So sort of this now is a, is a look at the UV luminosity function of the first galaxies, and this is a messy plot, so I try to break this down. Um, so right. Uh, Redshift 8, where we have lots of data from Hubble. This is sort of pre, uh, pre JWST, and of course there's right a, uh, right a pretty uh, complete sampling uh, out to right uh, uh, to, a, to, a, to a limit. But of course now the question is what happens at Redshift 10 and 15. And um, in particular, if we just now um, go to Redshift 15, um, and this is at this point based on a on a on a simulation, right? Uh, so then um, right uh, there are. Um, these, these uh, reddish points, they show uh, systems that are enriched with, uh, with uh, heavy elements, population two, two galaxies. Uh, and uh, well, they are in, within reach, so um, right, the JWST will see them, and uh, right, the prediction is also that at some point we will see the turnover in the, in the luminosity function. So this will be seen, but then again, right, what about the primordial universe? So then, right, this is sort of here marked by these uh, Roman numeral three symbols. Those are those are galaxies that would be completely primordial, uh, and they are there, right? But uh, then, if you think about right, uh, their the magnitude, they are uh, even be beyond the limit of uh, JWST plus lensing. So, right, one prediction of uh, Lambda CDM cosmology is that if we push uh, JWST to the limit, right, what we should see in the deep field is um, uh, metal enriched galaxies. It is possible to to simulate a universe, and I'm sure that some of the people in the audience have also done this, it's absolutely possible to change that. If you play with Lambda CDM, for example, you do things like fuzzy dark matter, where you have nothing happening early on, push everything to later times, right, you can build a different universe. Um, so at some point, right, uh, this is a test of, uh, right, of Lambda uh, CDM. And of course, as you know, right, uh, it is already tested now with some tension, and we will get back to that. Um, but this is a very robust prediction. So right, uh, we should see um, a very, very rich um, um, right, um, um, picture landscape of, uh, of um, uh, galaxies at the limit of what the JWST can see. But we should still miss uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, Right, these mystical, uh, pure population three uh, systems. Um, so we have to see. But that is a, re a very robust prediction. And then uh, there is one little uh, caveat, and uh, I'm sure that uh, right, many of you have followed this. There was sort of this really interesting uh, paper in Nature posted by Welchardal, right? Um, the Sunrise Arc Galaxy. And uh, right, this is a, um, a, in a highly magnified uh, dwarf galaxy at a redshift of uh, 6.2. And then also uh, by a, a, a pure chance uh, event, there is a, a, an object which uh, the team called Arendelle, I guess, right, old English for morning star. So Arendelle, right, the way the properties are this, uh, has to be because it's so, it's so incredibly compact um, right, and its lensing properties are such that it, it is a single star or maybe a small multiple. And then also by looking at the properties, right, based on, on this HST, this was uh, an HST discovery still, um, right, the prediction is that this uh, star has to be at least 50 solar masses or larger. And then, of course, in the paper, right, uh, they speculate maybe right, this is, uh, by, uh, by chance, uh, a population three star. Because right, uh, if we get massive, right, at some point, population three may be in the, in the picture. On the other hand, Right, 6.2, of course, this is uh, late in the game in the sense of metal enrichment. Uh, so then um, uh, at Austin, we did a paper to actually quantify this, the probability of finding uh, the probability that uh, Arendelle will turn out to be a pop three star. So this was led by, uh, by a UT postdoc, uh, Anna Schauer. And uh, so we predicted the probability um, right, as a function of the mass. Um, and uh, sort of just if you focus here on these solid curves, um, right, there are some assumptions on, on uh, right, um, 
um, what we assume for the modeling, but the message is that uh, right, uh, the probability is actually shockingly large. It's a few percent. So the probability is uh, right, uh, that Arundel turns out to be a population three star because of this lensing um, effect uh, right, is a few percent. And if we push this to right, higher and higher masses, uh, 100, 200, right, then of course the, the probability goes up uh, dramatically for POP3 because this is what POP3 does. Right? It, it produces uh, right, uh, massive stars. Uh, so this is a, a little bit of a, right, a way out of this uh, picture that I said JWST will not find uh, population three star. Although, I mean, yeah, the chance is a few percent. But uh, it's worth paying attention. And uh, right, um, the Welch et al. group, um, based on relics, right, uh, Co et al. Uh, promised to yeah, then uh, right, do near spec uh, spectroscopy uh, and uh, basically give us the answer uh, next year. So we have to see. But this is sort of an exciting little possible way out to actually get to the primordial universe. Um, OK. So, um, there's sort of one, uh, one more thing that uh, I would like to add in terms of the standard model of first stars. So now we have, a, we have one of these first stars that is, um, that is um, enriched with, uh, with heavy elements. And now sort of I show you what kind of star formation we get in, um, in the first galaxy, the second time that the universe has the chance to form stars. So uh, this is um, a gas that is enriched with, uh, with uh, the first heavy elements from, from the first supernovae. Uh, at a level of maybe 1% solar. And then right, with uh, adaptive mesh refinement, we can really nail this, uh, zoom in. And this is sort of the, the hydrogen gas uh, in, in projection again. Uh, and then what we see is uh, right, that star formation inside of the first galaxies. Uh, again, right, the second time that the universe forms stars looks uh, qualitatively very similar to uh, star formation in the present day universe. Because now this is also dominated by supersonic turbulence. There's fragmentation. Um, Right, the, the filaments uh, break up, um, and there's this intricate dance um, of uh, building up the structure. And uh, let's see what happens. Uh, we zoom in, and uh, then right, we can, we can uh, right, uh, with a zoom-in simulation, get to the point where we form individual protostars. Um, and then we count. Right? We, take a, we take a histogram, um, and uh, right, then right, sort of, uh, the message here is that right, this already looks um, uh, right, to, to first order, like the standard um, uh, initial mass function of star formation right, uh, today, um, with the Salt-Peter slope. So the message is, right, um, early on, we have the first stars, um, completely different, a singular mode of star formation. And then the second time uh, that the universe has the chance to form stars, it's already right, the standard way. So the universe very, very quickly uh, forms stars in the, um, in the standard uh, fashion. So right, this sort of is. Um, the basic picture. Of course, now we want to, to go and, um, and test it. Um, and uh, well, of course, uh, right, as we said, um, for, for decades, this was a, a theorist playground. Uh, we have uh, right, uh, burned millions of cycles of, uh, of supercomputer power. Uh, and now it's really time to, um, to confront this with reality. And of course, right, I'm sure we all have, have spent right, the morning of uh, uh, right, uh, Christmas Day, December 25th, to see this. And of course, right, as you know, this was beautifully successful. It was so successful that now, instead of 10 years, right, we even have a 20-year expectation for the, for the James Webb Space Telescope, which of course is fantastic, because then we will have an overlap with the, right, with the generation of extremely large telescopes on the ground. So this is just wonderful news. But of course, now also, right, uh, the fun is starting. And then, right, uh, of course, right, we have all followed, as everyone in the world, the early release. Um, Right, including the White House uh, uh, and uh, right, uh, the world media, the, 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 the cover pages of the newspaper. But of course, really, um, uh, sort of late July was a, an exhilarating time, I think, for all of us as a community. And this is sort of our Austin version. This actually is a, is a shot from within our uh, uh, supercomputer center. We call it the TAC, the Texas Advanced uh, um, Computing Center. And this sort of uh, are members of the of the JWST CS team, led by, by my colleague uh, Steve Finkelstein. Um, uh, and um, right, they then uh, uh, projected uh, the, right, the, early, the early release data onto, onto this projection wall. And it was just right, a spectacular right, uh, uh, emotional moment for, uh, for all of us. And um, then right, for us, really, then uh, this uh, led to, uh, to this mosaic being analyzed uh, right, um, um, that um, Right, the, the CS team identified a candidate um, 
uh, which now is known by, by the name of Macy's Galaxy. Some of you know the story, right? Macy is the name of, uh, of Steve Finkelstein's uh, nine-year-old daughter. Um, and uh, right, one has to say, of course, this was not Steve's idea. His team basically said, look, let's do this, because they really were sure that they had a, a very high redshift uh, source at the day of, of Macy's birthday. So this is how this, um, this name came about. And I think it's a lovely name. Um, so Macy's Galaxy, and of course, you also know that initially, right, um, the redshift was, uh, was even higher, redshift 14. Um, but then right, uh, um, the team understood right, what was going on. There was an astrometric uh, issue with one of the, the HST frames. Uh, and now the, the robust uh, confirmed um, uh, right, photometric redshift is, uh, is, uh, is about a redshift of 12. Uh, it's still right, an extremely high redshift um, uh, galaxy. And then, of course, you know there are right, other groups who have similarly right, um, suggested these candidates. Of course, at this point, this is all photometry, near come, right? This is all early. And of course, you have followed probably the, the grapevine, the news, right? There are issues with, with templates. How good are the templates? How bad are the templates, uh, right? Uh, um, that uh, there are corrections. Uh, so this is, of course, really all still in place. Uh, but um, right, uh, there are these, uh, right, there is this abundance of, um, of surprisingly massive galaxies uh, at redshifts beyond what, what we had with Hubble. And of course, right then there is this current record possibility, right? The Scottish group, um, right? Maybe even, right? Almost 17. But of course, all of this, right, is uh, is uh, at this point uh, photometric. Uh, near come, right? Uh, early next year, when we will have spectroscopy, we will we will know. Um, but again, right? So this is um, really really exciting because now we uh, we have the first view, right? This abundance of massive galaxies, and um, well. Um, then just to also show this, right, this is, I guess, um, uh, again, Macy's Galaxy, uh, right, uh, the Finkelstein Sears group, um, right, it's, uh, it's a template fitting uh, technique and SED fitting. Uh, and uh, the message here is, right, the stellar mass estimate um, is uh, such that uh, it's about uh, right, 10 to the uh, 8.5, so um, just below a billion, um, a billion solar masses. So right, there is this abundance of luminous, massive galaxies. Uh, and that is surprising because uh, right, this uh, image that I showed, right, this uh, is worth um, uh, one day of, uh, of JWST near CAM. Right? It's not like many weeks like we had with the ultra deep field for Hubble. Right? This is uh, 24 hours. Uh, and so then in 24 hours, really, um, um, the expectation was uh, not that we uh, see this abundance of massive luminous galaxies, uh, uh, but we do. Uh, right? uh, uh, modulo uh, issues with possible corrections. Um, so um, then, just to, um, to hone in a little bit more on what, what the problem is. So um, right, um, the prediction, the predicted number counts um, is sort of shown here. So right, uh, one means one source found by, by the seers uh, a field with, uh, with, uh, with the approach they had. And uh, right, basically, almost all of these, these are predictions. Right? Uh, they are simulations. They are semi-analytic models. Uh, and they all basically would predict that you would not find um, right, a single object. CS shouldn't find an object. Um, uh, maybe there's one exception, the Berusi and Silk model, right, which is sort of semi-empirical. It's an extrapolation. Um, and that sort of uh, right, could, uh, could be reconciled. But then also, right, if you look at this sort of an, a different way, um, right, uh, the number um, predicted different models, right, um, uh, as a function of, uh, of, uh, of brightness, um, and uh, right, um, the, the, the data point here lies on top of almost all of them. Of course, there is a large error bar, but still. Right? There is a clear a challenge because all of these models, simulations, semi-analytic models, they rely on lambda cold dark matter, lambda CDM. And then this then has really um, become known as sort of this, uh, this tension to standard lambda CDM. And um, right, um, there was a paper by Mike Ball and Colchin and others now right, uh, that have argued that lambda CDM cannot account for the stellar mass seen in these uh, early JWST near uh, fields. Uh, and um, sort of just to see this, um, and I apologize, this is a busy plot, but I try to yeah, walk you through this. Sort of this is one way to look at this. So what this is, is um, the, the, the cumulative stellar mass density um, that you have uh, at, as a function of, uh, of, of mass. Uh, and, uh, and just sort of uh, at first focus on, on, on this, uh, this curve, this black curve here. Uh, this is uh, um, the absolute maximum that you can get out of the early universe, um, in this case, redshift 10 in terms of the universe within lambda CDM forming stars. 
this is a crazy curve in a way because it assumes that we have 100% star formation efficiency. It assumes that all the baryons we have in the dark matter 100% form stars. And then right, we predict a certain amount of, um, of, uh, of stars. But then, right, again, right, first, uh, if you take it at face value, uh, JWST, in this case, it's the Labby et al. data. Right, uh, even then, they lie on top of, uh, of this crazy extreme curve. But of course, um, if the stellar masses come down, then of course, right, we can obviously uh, right, uh, relax this. But if we take this at face value, right, uh, this is uh, impossible to reconcile this in a lambda CDN because 100% right, star formation is, uh, of course, uh, completely crazy. This would be still pretty extreme, 10%. Right? Uh, so this is sort of what we could uh, right, hope to, uh, to get. So then there is a real tension, right? Because this is 10%, even if we shift, Right, so, um, but then it turns out that right, as a theorist, um, it is pretty easy to come up with structure formation models that um, um, prevents structure from forming early from having structure form later. For example, right, to solve the small scale structure problem of the universe. It's pretty easy. Right? You can have warm dark matter, a fuzzy dark matter. Um, right? There are many ways to do this. But the opposite, to, um, to start with lambda CDM and then on the baseline of lambda CDM to accelerate it, to get more structure out of the early universe, that is very, very hard. Um, and then really what you have to do is acts of desperation, really. You need to invoke exotic physics. Um, and uh, right, um, one uh, possibility that has been discussed is early dark energy, Klüppin et al. But here sort of I just want to throw in another um, act of desperation. Uh, this is uh, relying on what if a part of the dark matter is primordial black holes, uh, PBHs. Uh, and this was, a, was an idea that uh, uh, my former student, Buyo and Liu, and, and I worked out. Um, so then right, it is possible within sort of these PBH cosmology to get more structure formation, more star formation. So all this reddish, I mean, this greenish area, sort of this is what you could accomplish with PBH models, simply because right, uh, uh, with dark matter, you have, you have poor saw noise, you have more fluctuation, you can get more uh, structure formation early on, uh, statistically. But uh, you pay a price. Um, first of all, of course, we don't know right, whether PBH uh, dark matter exists. Um, but the other thing is, even if you uh, grant this, then uh, for this to work, then if you look into the details, you need extremely massive uh, PBHs, primordial black holes, a billion solar mass primordial black holes, which of course is pretty desperate. But again, so that just drives uh, the home point. I mean, if, right, as a theorist, of course, my, my professor as an undergrad told me, uh, Mr. Brom, uh, the observers are the god. Right? We have to obey as a theorist, of course, and of course that is true. But in this case, right, uh, 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 right, if, if there's a revision of these early JWST near come, right, stellar masses, redshifts, stellar masses down, redshifts down, I, I mean, this would be a real relief because otherwise uh, we are really in a very strange situation. Um, so we would need exotic, exotic physics. But uh, so my colleague, uh, right, Steve Finkelstein, said, right, I should not lose sleep. Right, uh, so uh, right, it's quite possible that uh, right, the numbers will uh, end up, uh, after all is said and done early next year, right, they will be in a, in a, in a more uh, uh, agreeable uh, parameter space. But we have to see. So this is interesting. Um, and then uh, just to throw in one other aspect of, right, we have this prediction of uh, the first stars and galaxies, early universe. Um, so we, of course, now uh, will exploit um, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, and this will really um, uh, become, right, uh, completely in its own next year when we have spectroscopy, the deep fields. Um, so uh, this will be a rapidly exploding field. But of course, then it's always good, right, to come uh, at this from different angles. So there's a, there's a different way to probe uh, the early universe, um, and this is sort of uh, sometimes called stellar archaeology. So now we look at, well, what are the remnants of the early universe in our local universe? Uh, redshift zero. So then, right, again, uh, this is a simulation showing something like the local group. So this would be a Milky Way uh, size, and then we have right, small um, uh, dwarf galaxies, and then right, uh, with uh, powerful supercomputers, one can zoom in and can then uh, simulate in great detail uh, the formation of a, of a local group dwarf galaxy. Uh, and uh, then we can sort of trace right, what, what kind of uh, remnants, fossils, do we have from the first stars. Um, and um, sort of the first thing is, um, right, that's really interesting, that if we look at the, right, at the star formation histories of these dwarf galaxies in a local group, um, and this was a, a work uh, led by, uh, by Myung Von John. Uh, um, um, and um, what, uh, what, uh, what this paper finds is that right, if you look at the star formation rate as a function of time, so right, then there is sort of a, 
uh, an important threshold in cosmic history, of course, the reionization. Um, uh, redshift 6, uh, slightly higher, uh, here shown by this gray, uh, by this gray uh, band. And then, right, there are, um, right, uh, of course, don't worry about right, all this, uh, this um, messy symbols. They indicate different dwarf galaxies as they are being built. And the important thing is that most of them, they form all their stars before reionization, and then they stop. And then right, uh, we were actually able to put a, a mass limit on this, uh, right, uh, something like a billion solar masses, virial dynamical mass. So those, uh, those systems, they form all their stars before reionization, and then they are, they are dead, red and dead. And then this would be um, right, local analogs for uh, ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. But then there are also other uh, systems which are a little bit more massive here, this little pink symbol, right, uh, continue to form stars until recent times. And then this could be something like a Leo P, gas rich system. Uh, so there's this, uh, this morphology. But then, very interestingly, right, for, for our purpose of testing the first stars, the first stars, POP3, right, um, top heavy initial mass function, the first supernovae, first heavy chemical elements, then we can sort of trace, and this is sort of done here, we trace uh, the, the metal abundance patterns in the second generation of stars. And then right, uh, all these little gray um, points here, they are abundance predictions for individual stars in a in an ultra-faint dwarf galaxy. Um, and uh, right, uh, really then right, one star at a, at a time. So this is a pretty, pretty detailed, um, uh, right, high-precision near-field cosmological prediction. Uh, and uh, it's in particular interesting to focus on carbon, um, the carbon en uh, enhancement, the alpha enhancement, uh, because sort of then we can uh, compare this with data, say, right, Segway 1, which is one of the right, uh, classical ancient uh, UFDs. Um, but the important point is right, we can now engage into this high-precision near-field cosmology, because um, right, the first stars, their properties, the IMF, the supernovae, that is reflected in these abundance patterns. And then we can compare this right, with uh, high-resolution, high-quality um, uh, data in the local group. And of course, right, at this point, this is just the beginning. Once we have the, right, the GMT, uh, the ELTs, uh, right, then basically right, we can take right, these spectra and these abundances for basically every star in one of these dwarf galaxies. So this will be then a one-to-one -one comparison, a very powerful uh, way. And just to, uh, to focus on one key element, um, that um, right, at some point is what is the chemical signature of a, of a first star? And then there is the idea that the first star put in place uh, a, a pattern of uh, extreme carbon enhancement. And the idea is right, just by way of cartoon. So we have a, a massive star that's about to explode. And if it is uh, right, uh, in the range of, uh, of a POP3 mass, uh, right, then um, uh, basically this star is able to throw out the, the light elements in the envelope, uh, carbon, oxygen, uh, maybe nitrogen. Uh, but everything that is sort of heavier, iron, iron peak, even alpha elements, they are all retained. They are all gobbled up in the central black hole. So then, right, uh, the idea is, uh, is sort of often called faint supernovae, um, marking the typical end of a first star. Then, uh, right, uh, what we have is a pattern of highly carbon-enriched uh, uh, stars. And this is, um, right, um, seen. Um, so um, let's sort of show this in a bit more detail. So, um, right, um, there is, a, there is a, a phenomenology in the Milky Way, uh, right, uh, Stellar archaeologists call this group three, sort of those are of these, uh, these reddish uh, uh, squares. Uh, they are observed in the, in the Milky Way, and they really, uh, the lower we get in metallicity, F u over h, right, the more carbon enhanced they are. So this is the data. And then, right, in a simulation, we can sort of try to explain this. We explain this with population three stars, with population two stars. Population two stars here are marked by blue, right, sort of they can do it, but pop three because they put into place this carbon pattern, right, they could exactly match it. Uh, so right, uh, this is another way to test um, the predictions uh, about the first stars in uh, quite a bit of, uh, of detail. And then just to, to finish up, one more sort of subplot of this uh, cosmic archaeology uh, way to look at the properties of the first stars. And this is sort of a really interesting, exciting, completely different um, a channel, if you like, multi-messenger astronomy, gravitational wave archaeology. Uh, and um, right, now we have a LIGO-Virgo database of merging black holes, binary black holes, which is growing. Um, right, now it's a few hundreds. This will become right, a few thousands uh, in the near future. And of course, right, then there is, a, is an intricate zoo. Of course, it is just a small subset. But then there is sort of one class of mergers which is difficult to understand uh, um, because they are involving uh, 
primaries, uh, primaries and secondaries which are more massive than right, normal stellar evolution can explain this. Um, right, 65 solar masses, uh, uh, 88 solar masses, and this sort of lies in what, um, what st stellar structure calls the pair instability gap. So normal stars don't really easily can, can make these kind of progenitors. But there are right, gravitational wave sources that have these properties. And then we have argued that with uh, population three, because right, the way that they, um, they behave, they are biased towards massive stars, right, we, could, um, we could explain these gap elements. Uh, and in particular, there is this famous right, uh, uh, GW1905-21. Right, if you follow uh, the gravitational wave field, sort of this uh, right, has gotten a lot of attention. And uh, it's not easy to explain. But in principle, with the population three origin, Right, this uh, can be explained um, quite straightforwardly. And then, just also to look a little bit in the, f in the future. So, um, right here, again, right with, uh, with Buyo and Liu, what we have looked at is um, right, uh, what would be the expected um, landscape of uh, uh, gravitational wave, waveform, strain versus frequency. And so then, right, all these little gray curves, they are simulated uh, mergers of uh, population three binaries. So in spiral, um, right, uh, merging, ring down. And then the, the, the message is here that quite a few of them, right, um, they will make it into the, into the LIGO, uh, Virgo um, um, uh, observability band. Uh, and uh, we actually have predicted that uh, even a few percent of the LIGO sample right, may have a population three origin. And that is sort of really exciting because POP3, normally right, they are incredibly underdominant, subdominant. Right, uh, 10 to the minus 3, minus 4, minus 5. It's a needle in the haystack. But in a way, right, with the gravitational wave database, we may have uh, a way to, uh, to boost this. Uh, and um, then, of course, uh, there's one other is aspect. Right? Of course, it depends on when we have the merger. So these are quite recent mergers, which vanish. Um, and then uh, once we get to things like the, the Einstein telescope, right, we can even catch uh, right, uh, uh, very high redshift merging sources, which are close to um, right, to the in situ formation channel. So this is another really exciting way to, to probe um, black holes from the first stars. And with that, um, I, I just um, conclude by saying that this is um, a very dynamic field. It's incredible fun to do it right, as a theorist. Now sort of it's showtime. Right? We have all worked for a long time. And now sort of the curtain is about to be lifted. Right? Uh, and probably most many of the predictions that uh, that my colleagues and I made uh, will turn out to be wrong, but of course that's wonderful. Uh, and uh, right, uh, what really is at stake here is that um, we really want to close this final gap in our cosmic worldview. Right? Uh, as astronomers, of course, we are not modest in this respect. Right? We want to understand the entire history of the universe, and this is what, what this is. And it really is driven by, uh, by, uh, by super technology. Right? Uh, um, supercomputers, super telescopes, and of course, right, uh, Harvard and UT Austin, of course, we are partners in trying to, uh, to make the GMT possible. And of course, right, this is um, exactly what is driving right, this whole field. Uh, and uh, right, what is this all about, really, that we address one of the very big questions of, uh, of humanity, right? What are our cosmic origins? How did it all begin? And uh, with that, uh, I'm at the end of my talk. Thank you for your attention. How robust do you think these results are regarding these uh, phot photoses of redshift 10, 11, and so on? Because uh, you, I'm sure you probably seen it. Like a couple of days ago, there was a spectrum at redshift 9.5, a beautiful one from James Webb, and it doesn't resemble at all of what you've shown uh, as the model. So the lines are totally different. So there's no UV lines. There is O3 instead of O2. The Balmer is pretty pretty faint. So, uh, what's your take? My take is that let's have that conversation uh, in the spring. Um, so, uh, because I mean, at this point, uh, like with Nearcam, of course, like the early right, uh, July, early August, I mean, there was lots of uh, um, right, uh, um, um, uh, results that had to be withdrawn. So, I would say uh, let's uh, let's wait until we have the picture right uh, 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 early spring, because I think then right, uh, like with uh, with, uh, with the imaging, right, with the photometry. Uh, Right, uh, there were the issues of adjusting the templates into this new regime, same, even more so with spectroscopy. So I would say, uh, let's wait uh, till, till early, uh, till the spring. Uh, 
Volker. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned gamma ray bursts several times, but I, I think these are going to be a critical test of when POP3 <coughs> formation began, because if they are rapidly rotating, as you mentioned, and they're very massive, it's very likely they're going to produce GRBs, which will be luminous enough to detect with current detectors. And the reason they haven't been is there are no redshifts available. Uh, you know, the highest redshift GRB is at roughly 9, and 15 or to 20 is a long way to go. But there are ways of, of dealing with that, which we'll talk about when we get together. Because I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, right, uh, because now we know right, there's, there is all of this star formation out there. So, I mean, right, uh, if we are, if we have any clue, and even though if uh, if we are roughly on the on the right path, of course, there is this population of uh, of, uh, of the high redshift gamma ray bursts because right, we have massive stars rotating all of this, and of course, obviously, yeah. Uh, so uh, they are there. We have to find them, of course, for a while. I guess there was a sociological challenge, um, right, a funding challenge, all on this, but uh, they are out there. I would agree. And of course, this, of course, would then really get us to the beginning. Right, uh, the question is going to be, what's the trade-off between supernovae? and GRBs, because that's going to affect... Yeah, I mean, sort of, uh, right, uh, I didn't have time to talk about this, but sort of, right, uh, the message is that uh, GRBs are rare in terms of numbers, but of course, obviously, they hit you on the head. Uh, right, they dominate the... Right, uh, so in terms of numbers, uh, there are many more of these even exotic supernovae, even possible pair instability supernovae, but they are swamped. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, right, uh, this is sort of why there is an interesting, I guess, dialectic between GRBs and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and the supernovae. And uh, we have to sort of play this game. Right, in the, it's an optimization problem. Any further? Mm -hmm. um, professor, may I assume that you are presently uninformed that the, or the hydrodynamics community has basically solved the tension problem 30 years ago in identifying that in the earliest moments of the universe, Hydrodynamics, and in particular, dirty baryonics, um, I'm talking about turbulence, uh, should have dominated the picture from day one. And that um, galaxy formation um, should have begun already a hundred million years. So that's, uh, I'm sorry, already a million years after the Big Bang. Yes, I can just say that um, right, um, we, um, we have one advantage uh, right, uh, when we do these simulations that uh, right, uh, I think everyone understands that there are important things that we don't understand about uh, the early universe, the ultra-early universe. But to a certain degree, right, we have a way to overcome this problem because right, we, sort of, we know from the, from the cosmic microwave background sort of what, uh, what the answer is that nature gave in terms of whatever the contributing effects are. So at some point, but even if you don't understand and maybe even make assumptions that are partially um, right wrong, uh, we have uh, we have a cross check with uh, with the cosmic microwave background, and this is a, this is a sort of a, a safety net uh, that we uh, that we have. If I may reply, um, the, the simulations do not include turbulence. So how can you presume to know what would happen if you did include turbulence? Yeah. Well, the turbulence, the turbulence community has worked out the entire problem yes, yes, yes. and uh, finds no, no tension. They, they celebrate the but, tension that you mentioned. Yeah, but turbulence like this, this would show up in the, in the, in the CMB. Because like, turbulence uh, like, uh, would, uh, uh, would hit us on the head in, in, in modifying the, the CMB as high precision data. So um, right, there's, uh, there are limits to, right, to what, uh, what we can uh, right, contemplate in terms of uh, right, hydrodynamic processes in the early universe. It's not that right, uh, uh, we are, are unconstrained. Uh, un, uh, yeah. So, Paul, you kind of threw this bombshell about one of the crazy ideas being 10 to the 9 solar mass primordial black holes. I mean, I've not heard about this possibility before, but isn't that such a population already ruled out by lensing data? Yes, yes. I mean, um, I'd, um, uh, in the paper we, uh, we discussed this, right, because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, very, very difficult to reconcile this with, uh, 
with, uh, with all kinds of constraints. Also CMD constraint, right? Uh, new distortions, uh, a large scale structure, uh, Lyman alpha uh, forest lensing. So it's, uh, it's very tough. Of course, you can then come with epicycles. You can say, right, uh, let's come up with epicycles. But it's really, it's, a, it's desperation. It's not, a, it's not, it's not an, I, I wouldn't really bet my, my house on it. Bye bye. Oh yes, yes. Uh, I, I, if I, that's uh, of course. Uh, thank you, uh, Charles. Uh, this is also really, really interesting because, uh, right, of course, there's uh, the idea that um, right, this 21 centimeter cosmology, of course, we really can can learn about uh, the early universe in ways that we cannot any other way. Then, of course, there are these early signs of uh, of early coupling um, between between star formation and. Uh, and, uh, and uh, 21 centimeter at the edges uh, um, result, of course. Uh, um, this is really, really interesting. And of course, edges is obviously a matter of debate, right? Maybe it's, uh, it was an artifact, maybe it's still there. Of course, eventually we will learn and we will, we will nail this. But uh, um, of course, that, um, that would indicate sort of similar, the message from this is uh, right, if something like edges is, is, is on the right track, but right? if we have this coupling, right, uh, a global uh, 21 centimeter absorption signal, this would mean that star formation has to happen really early. Uh, and this would also, for example, refute things like fuzzy dark matter, because like, fuzzy dark matter completely wipes out any star formation, galaxy formation at those redshifts. So it all push this to, uh, to recent redshift. So um, super interesting, and I had it in my, in my last <laughs> uh, colloquium talk, but now I had to pick it up, but uh, super interesting. And I mean, a 21 centimeter cosmology, of course, right, this, is, uh, this will dominate the scene, right, where we are going eventually with the SKA, right, uh, this will be, and it's, of course, wonderfully complementary, right, it's a cold universe, then we have, right, the, the initial conditions of star formation, galaxy formation, and then the, right, the, the ultraviolet observations, so this will be fantastic, right, the synergy. Uh, was there a question in the back here? Yeah, you mentioned edges. Yes. You know, for those of us who haven't followed the latest, I know that there have been other measurements. The group in India has definitely produced, I thought, pretty good results, which ruled out edges. Yes. <coughs> so it appeared to me, but I'm not the expert. You are at least talking to the experts, the instruments, instrument people. What is the current thinking among you know those who actually do these experiments? Should we take edges seriously or not? Well, I mean, um, I, I, I remember I had a similar question. I went to, to NRAO um, uh, in, in Socorro, um, and uh, right then basically there was exactly the, uh, the discussion, of course. And of course, in that case, I could, I could just throw it back to, to them yeah, uh, and say, look, you are the expert who sorted <laughs> out and just told them for, for the viewpoint, from the viewpoint of uh, right, theoretical structure formation, it's a super interesting constraint either way. Um, so, um, but I mean, my, I don't know. I mean, my, my reading is that um, right, uh, both groups are really right, uh, top notch uh, and uh, right, highly regarded. They have this completely uh, contradictory result. So let's wait um, right, until we get a third, uh, <laughs> fourth. Uh, so, but I mean, it's a matter of time because it was right, different from a transient. Right, uh, this, this, will, this will be there forever, so, yeah. right, even if you take a bit longer to nail this. But I mean, either way, right, it's an important data point. Uh, but it's strange that uh, right, the, the one group that very strongly detected and the others that very strongly non-detection. And both are very highly regarded. Right? It's not that, uh, so uh, that is a strange situation. But I'm not a radius for that. So the way I was glad when I was at, at Socorro that I could just uh, tell them, look, guys, sort it out. I guess the last possible signpost of these redshifts are accreting massive black holes, supermassive black holes. What, what do you have uh, predictions for them when they actually turn on and become useful beacons? Yes, that is uh, also, that, is, uh, that would be a lovely right, uh, full talk in its own right. The idea of right, uh, first black holes, uh, right, how do we seed um, a quasar activity? Uh, and, uh, and there is an idea, um, I, I just sort of have, maybe sort of, uh, because I, that's sort of the best I can show you right now. Sort of like this is sort of under this. This is this acronym: DCBH, Direct Collapse Black Hole. Sort of those are um, special conditions in the early universe. You have a primordial cloud um, that has about a million solar masses, and uh, it's collapsing. And normally, this would lead to vigorous star formation because collapse triggers fragmentation. But under the conditions in the early universe, right, um, where we have no metals, uh, and also somehow. Uh, uh, 
base the cloud with a strong uh, flux of, um, of soft UV radiation, then there's also no, no molecular hydrogen. That means the cloud cannot cool, so that we have an isothermal collapse. And then there, there's this prediction, um, and uh, this is actually what I worked with Aaron uh, 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 on as well. Right? Then we have the prediction that uh, right, out of this comes uh, in Van Gogh, um, right, um, uh, a black hole that already has about 100,000 solar masses. So they're called DCBH, direct collapsed black holes, and uh, right, they would be so bright luminous that they right, could be detected um, right, uh, with, uh, with the JWST, they would be very blue, uh, and also right, they would show up in, the, right, in this, in this uh, gravitational wave the signature if they, if they have mergers right, uh, with future um, right, uh, uh, telescopes that could be also picked up. But, um, so DCBH, I mean, that, um, right, how, do we, how do we get black holes into the early universe? Yeah, this is... Um, uh, also, uh, we will learn a lot about right, uh, over the next few years. But so, yeah, I mean, um, the prediction is that there are, that there are these ex exotic uh, direct collapse black holes because without it, right, it's difficult to understand things. Why do we have billion solar mass quasars um, right, uh, one billion years after the universe? So, this is sort of, it is a timing problem. And again, I, I apologize that I couldn't put this in, uh, but that is also a super interesting question. So black holes, but this is sort of what we learned. Black holes, right, they, uh, similar to star formation, supernovae, black holes uh, play an important role also really early in cosmic history with all like, the interesting uh, astrophysics um, and X-ray uh, uh, feedback that is involved. All right, with that, let's end. And Thank you.